team. Now, um, uh, part of having Jason on for this discussion tonight is largely due to the fact that Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing a number of, of questions which are uh, essential to understand the current political process, and not so much as an observer, but as participants. And that really is the unique aspect of Mr. LaRouche's contribution towards uh, this political process. He has been intervening to shape the current discussion politically for over the last 50 years. And what we are seeing over this, the last weeks, um, has been an increasing consolidation of what Mr. LaRouche himself has been striving for, both from a, geo from a political and strategic perspective, uh, the collaboration of nations like Russia, China, India, and others, as well as the economic perspective around the New Silk Road, One Belt, One Road policy, and this is now encompassing nations like Iran, Egypt, Turkey, and threatening to include even the nations of Germany and Europe. But there has also been a significant emphasis on the questions of space exploration. And it was just this past week where China announced that they are considering a manned radar station on the moon. Uh, this accompanies their program for exploration of the far side of the moon. And so we see a, a kind of a, a, a new human species developing on the planet. Now, with discuss, in discussion with colleagues over this past Sunday, Mr. LaRouche was very clear that given the rate of development and given the upcoming events that are taking place over the month of September, just in the first week, there are three major heads of state summits in Vladivostok, with Russia, China, South Korea, and Japan, then the G20, which will have nearly 30 heads of states of the largest economies in the world. And then the ASEAN plus six, which will include India, China, Russia, South Korea, Japan, and the United States, along with all the Southeast Asian nations. But in that context, it is a question of what role we play. Uh, and he emphasized that the role we play is of a conceptual advancement, especially in the New York City area and Manhattan deployment. And obviously that is ongoing as we speak tonight. There is a number of deployments, including mass distributions of the new Hamiltonian newspaper, which is entitled, Obama is a failure. The world needs a new financial architecture now. So that will be going out as early as tomorrow throughout New York City. And we are three weeks approximately from a major cultural intervention around September 11th with four concerts. But that, but that still leaves us with the conceptual advancement. And what Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing over the last months, and perhaps over the last 40 or 50 years, is a quality of thinking which he himself has probably, probably or has been the best living demonstration of a higher quality of creative thinking available to the human species. But in communicating that, and, and, and looking to find ways of capturing the essence of that quality of thinking, he has found a, a key collaborator in Albert Einstein, and what he has termed the Einstein Principle, which reflects both on Einstein's unique creative contributions to human thought in general, not just particularly so-called physics, of which many might try to limit Albert Einstein, by which they would have significant difficulty in doing so, but also to get at Mr. LaRouche's own quality of unique contribution to human creative thought. And that I think is the basis for the discussion tonight. And hopefully we can have a number of questions and discussions with Jason. So if Jason, if you're on, um, welcome. And if you'd like to have some opening comments, why don't you jump in? And the Q and A session is open. So if people want to hit star six to jump in, as soon as Jason's done with some opening comments, we can jump into the dialogue tonight. So Jason, are you there? Yeah, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, just fine. Welcome. Thanks. Um, I can just say a little bit. Uh, you know, there have been the interview with uh, Phil Rubenstein on Wednesday and some thoughts on the um, on the webcast last Friday. So I'll be very short. Uh, Einstein is somebody who is dramatically misunderstood. That's one of the first points that LaRouche makes about him. He's a misunderstood person. And the emphasis he had placed on him most recently was that Einstein's role is not the specific principles that he came up with, but with how they're created. 
and with his devotion to the increase of mankind's ability to increase our powers of developing more such principles. It's not his mathematics, it's the self-creation of the human species. That defines the nature of the human individual. That's why Einstein is necessary as a role model of sorts today. And that the rate of development of future generations surpassing the preceding ones, that's a measure of our role in continuing the development of the universe, something that our species uniquely can do. That's all I'd like to say to open. Okay, great. So if people want to jump into the queue uh, by hitting star six, we can get the discussion going tonight. I'm sure people have all kinds of thoughts. And Jason is not just here to discuss Einstein as an, an subject per se, but to apply Einstein and Lin's way of thinking, um, perhaps to some of the political discussions. But to start off, Jason, we got one question in from uh, an internet uh, a source or a person on the internet or via email which is, it was a little contentious. So let me start with this to give people an idea of how uh, the nature of some of these, the, 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 the political nature of the subjects that we're raising tonight. It says, dear basement team, that you do not know or speak the truth about this is most shameful. Those who lie to others must first lie to themselves. Shall we slander those who speak up for truth as Nazis? Ad hominem attacks to dismiss that which you do not like. How politically correct. And he goes on to say, are you ideologically bound as any Stalinist or Trotskyite? And basically goes through how Einstein plagiarized much of his work. Um, he was a supporter of the supreme, supremacy ideology. So this person had quite uh, a, re a reaction to Einstein. So Jason, why don't you say some things in regards to this, and then we can get into the question process. Yeah, sure. I mean, this, this question is not atypical. I mean, there's a lot of, if you look through the other videos that we've put up on Einstein, or frankly, videos that anybody's put up on Einstein on YouTube, and you, uh, you make what's often the mistake of looking through the comments section, you'll see a ton of people saying Einstein was a plagiarist, he was a liar. Uh, some people are pretty open in just attacking him for being Jewish. Or they'll say that Einstein was a fool, Nikola Tesla, he's the real genius. You guys are missing Nikola Tesla, who is, you know, a god among men. Well, it's the, a few things about this. One is that, for emphasis I began with, that the point about Einstein isn't some specific formulas. You know, some of the attacks on him run the range of saying that, you know, Lorentz, uh, Henrik Lorentz had come up with the transformations of special relativity before Einstein did. Yes, he came up with those formulas before Einstein did, but they had a completely different physical meaning for him. So it's just, a lot of it's just illiteracy of people who don't, you know, haven't done the really extensive work that's required to understand some of these concepts, but who still feel themselves entitled to go on about who actually discovered things that whose meaning they're actually unaware of. Um, and I think the other part of this stuff comes from a sort of underdog or defeatist mentality. The idea that anybody who is good must be being oppressed by some grand conspiracy. And, you know, that takes the form of some scientists or engineers like Tesla supposedly being, you know, held down by some conspiracy pioneered by Albert Einstein who I don't know, somehow gained control of world science and used it to put people down. It, it's really ahistorical, um, but I think what it reflects socially is a sense that there's always, you know, some powerful force keeping down the truth and uh, anything that's popular must be wrong, which, frankly, thinking that anything popular must be wrong, that's, that's not a, uh, a bad hunch to have. Um, but in, you know, in terms of the, you know the email, the, the the message we get on the internet that you're referring to, Michael, I mean a lot of these links just don't make any sense at all. Just full of uh, I don't know. I don't want to get too specific. One of them said that Michelson and Morley had already proven that the speed of light is finite, which isn't what they proved and isn't in doubt by anybody. So I don't know. I'm not sure what to say about. Uh, some of this anti-Einstein stuff. Although, like I had said on the webcast um, or, and on the, um, on the interview on Wednesday, a lot of this began with the Nazis trying to clear up anything Jewish out of pure science. 
So the attacks on Einstein began definitely uh, from that front. And as you can see with some of the links and complaining that people do about Einstein and the Zionist conspiracy to take over science, it's that kind of uh, stuff's alive and well today, unfortunately. And that's what I can say to that, that, that internet comment in particular. Okay, good. Well, we've got a question lined up, so let's take this. This is, this is Fred from Louisiana. I've got the book Einstein, His Life and Universe by Walter Isaacson. What is your comment on that book? Um, I haven't read that book, so I guess I can't offer any comments on it, truthfully. I just uh, I was wondering how relative it is to the discussion. Well, you wouldn't know, huh? Not on that one in particular. I don't think you could go too wrong reading it, though. I mean, there's, in terms of, you know, books about Einstein, there's, I mean, one of the, you know, the really good ones to read is the book called Relativity, which was uh, written by Einstein a little later in his life, which was a guide to his theories of special and general relativity, written not as scientific papers to be published in a journal, but for a more general audience. Um, so that's a, that's a very good one. He's got autobiographical notes from when he was 67. He was asked to write down some notes about his life, which he did. Um, so that, that's in a book called Albert Einstein, Philosopher Scientist. And um, anyway, there's, I don't think you go too wrong reading that one. So <laughs> you can report back on it later. Good. Yeah, that that book. I've I've read some of it, and it's actually um, it's good on the early part of Einstein's life and his and his collaboration on music, his relationship to the the violin and Mozart and music, in regards to his scientific life, are uh, are captured well in that book. So it's worth reading, Fred. All right, we got another question up. So let's let's see what they got to say. Hello, this is Jerry in San Antonio, Texas. Albert Einstein was acutely aware of the general audience. This is why he formulated a lot of these thought pictures to illustrate his uh, theories of relativity. You know, like trains going by and listening to clocks in the distance and things like that. But as he did this, he was making an effort to make this stuff available to the popular audience. But he knew that oversimplifying these concepts was uh, a sort of a deception. And I'd like to read you a quote of something that he said about himself in this respect. The quote goes like this. The exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. That's the end of the quote. Uh, so <laughs> I, I read this quote as, as being something like, uh, in trying to popularize himself, you know, in a subject that can't be popularized. It reminds me of a little like something that Pablo Picasso said. Picasso said, art is the lie that tells the truth. Please continue with your discussion. I'm very, very interested in it. Thank you for listening to me. Mike? Thanks. Right. Well, I mean, it's hard to, it's always hard to make, um, figure out what to say about, you know, short quotes without the, the context. And usually nobody actually, nobody speaks in, in short, um, chunks like that on their own. And I recognize, you know, you're not going to read a, you know, on this phone call, read a, you know, three pages out of a book or anything like that. I don't think that it's possible to, believe that you understand everything about general relativity from reading some of these simpler accounts. For example, the, the, the special relativity um, isn't 
nearly as complicated. These experiments with the, the clocks and the trains, they really do provide enough to be able to get the, the type of physics that ends up being involved with it. Um, for people who haven't watched the, uh, the videos that we've had on Einstein, we do have some very good pedagogies um, from Shauna from some years back that go through some of the concepts of special relativity. We've talked about some of them. Like, for example, the, just to get into one specific one, the very powerful concept, very simple and powerful concept, that there's no such thing as simultaneity as a universal concept, that there isn't a single time that all measurements, that all events can be measured in. And Einstein demonstrated that with this experiment, this thought experiment that you can imagine in your mind of the motion of the train whereby the person standing in the station would say that flashes of light at the front and back of the train occurred simultaneously, whereas the person inside the train would have said that the flash at the front of the train occurred before the one at the back. Now, this might seem sort of, you know, who cares, what difference does it make? Unless you're moving near the speed of light, these effects aren't all that noticeable. But the profound implication of demonstrating physically why there is no such thing as a single simultaneity or of one instant for all of the universe or this idea of having one time only, uh, it tears apart the idea of absolute space and absolute time, the concept that those two space and time could even be separated at all. It eliminates the possibility of action at a distance, meaning that no force can occur instantaneously through space since there is no instance. It has all these implications which are very, um, very intense. And, you know, I'd say that in terms of things that have been tested, uh, Einstein's thoughts about special relativity have been tested, his forecasts in general relativity about things like the light from stars changing its color based on how massive they are, on light bending around the sun, on the behavior of, you know, they've sent clocks and airplanes and rockets. Um, the GPS system, just for example, after a week, if the corrections for relativity were not made, uh, your GPS signal would be off by about a mile. So, um, but I understand what you're saying. It's always difficult to encapsulate everything or try to be brief while also being accurate on very complex concepts. The quote that you had read reminded me of um, the quote that Vladimir Vernadsky had, had quoted on at least one occasion, that a thought once uttered is untrue, that you never really are fully able to communicate your thoughts, in part because they're always developing. That's useful. Um, now, Jason, our audience is a little bit shy tonight, so if people don't know, they hit it, need to hit star six for uh, to jump into the Q&A and, and participate in the discussion tonight. Everyone's encouraged and welcome. Just make make it clear that you have a question or a statement that Jason can address, and and um, it'll it'll help the discussion tonight. But Jason, perhaps you have some thoughts since you've been working with Lynn now for over 15 years. And you've had you've had a significant time. You were one of the founding members of the the basement research project, and you've done extensive work on Kepler. Perhaps you can situate your thoughts on why Lynn is now raising the Einstein principle as he is today, which I think would be useful for people. Hmm. Well, sure, I can I can say what I think about it. Although you know I'm not Larouche, and I'm not I'm not entirely sure uh, how he chose. Because you might you might ask yourself, well. Why Einstein, as opposed to bringing up the importance of Kepler or Mozart, uh, simply said, or you know, why not focus on the far side of the moon or on fusion energy? Now, these are all things that we've focused on in the past. They're all things that are important and you know worth looking at. So, you know, why would it be Einstein in particular? And I think that one of the really important things is that there's been two aspects in, in science. You know, there's been a train of development of people who moved science forward 
and took it to the next level. People like Nicholas of Cusa, who launched the renaissance of science through his understanding that knowledge doesn't come from the senses, knowledge doesn't come from understanding observations. I'm slightly putting words into his mouth, not quite from the era that he, that he was writing from. But Kuz's understanding that knowledge always comes from resolving a contradiction between contradictory concepts with a higher concept from which standpoint there's no contradiction anymore, or where the contradiction takes a different form. To be more specific about that, you know, LaRouche began the Basin process with a study of Kepler, with in particular Kepler's new astronomy as a way of understanding economic cycles of the economic process itself, where the key ingredient wasn't so much the likeness of a planetary orbit to an economic cycle, although he had a point on that. The greater importance was that Kepler was the man who created modern science. He was the first modern scientist. And it is astonishing that despite his works being available, uh, they've now been available in English for some decades, people don't understand how he did what he did. And what Kepler did was, was really beautifully wonderful. He took astronomy away from the domain of geometry or mathematics or observations and said that he was going to be so bold as to believe that his mind could comprehend causes, that his mind was able to understand why the universe acted the way that it did. And he had a physical hypothesis of gravitation and of the planetary motions. So, you know, this jump from describing observations to hypothesizing causes, that's the key to science, you know, that Kepler brought in. I think what you get with Einstein is two things. One is that he is our most recent reference point for somebody who absolutely revolutionized our concept of physics and of the universe. And secondly, you know, you might say, well, why hasn't there been anyone else since him of that stature? Where's been the next Einstein? Which takes you to the other side of it. The fight around what science is, around the soul of science that Einstein lived through and fought in. You know, Mr. LaRouche has been, I'd say over the past couple few years, been pointing to 1900, to the shift into the 20th century, and the changes in cultural outlook and scientific outlook that came at that time, led by people like Bertrand Russell, who LaRouche has called the most evil man of the 20th century, and he's got some competition, that what Russell, what Hilbert, what others did in the beginning in the early 1900s was to turn the clock back and say that the ability of the mind to really know anything is a conceit. That what science can really do, what knowledge can really be, is descriptions of phenomena. And that we can use mathematical formulas to describe what phenomena will be like, but fundamentally we can't actually know anything about them. And so that came up in two ways of Einstein's life. One is the misinterpretation of relativity. There's people think that Einstein proved that, you know, everything is relative or it all depends on your point of view. That's not relativity. And the second side of it is with the development of quantum science, where there was a real, you know, sort of get Einstein task force um, by people like uh, Bohr and others who were determined, who were adamant in saying that the new science of the future would not be one based on the knowability of a reality that lays behind our senses but that science could go no further than describing observations. They're completely explicit about that, saying that the bounds of science end at predicting what kind of observations we're going to make, and that if we go any further and try to say that we know something about the, a reality, about a real world besides our observations, that that's not allowed anymore. And that was something that Einstein fought against 
it made him somewhat of an outcast in science you know, in the later part of his life. But he absolutely fought against that, against the idea that quantum physics, quantum mechanics was essentially complete and that we really knew everything there was to know about the quantum world and that it was all about observations and a real world behind them uh, was rejected. So I think that that's, that's, you know, that's a very important aspect of it. And the other one, of course, is just that his, you know, his devotion to um, to the power of the human mind and that as the human identity, I think that's an essential thing for us to have today. And what's the basis for human beings to relate to each other? On what basis do we conceive each other? Do we relate to each other? Do we determine common ends to work together to achieve? Great, that was very useful. So we've got a couple of courageous souls, so let's take the next question. Um, second here, turn off my... Hi, uh, this is Tony Witcher from Lake Arrowhead. Hello. Um, I just thought I'd throw something in here to see, you know, what you what you guys would would say. Um, uh, it's the nature of the creative imagination, which Einstein so much uh, emphasized that this was what was necessary in order to understand the universe and understand it in in new ways that had never been understood before, and is the basis therefore of the progress of civilization. And uh, and I was wondering how you would say this 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 power of creative imagination also relates to that old philosophical question of of free will um, mm. that that uh, somehow man was supposed to be uh, you know possessed of this unique power called free will and then there were all the people who scoffed at that and said no man is just an animal man is you know no one has free will is just an illusion so you know if you say well the creative imagination is not only uh, is is some way that that we can understand and and do something new, like we can project a future that's actually different from the past, whereas um, mm -hmm. and we can understand the universe in ways that we have never understood it before. And if we can do that, then that you know is that what makes man truly unique in the uh, in the cosmos? Is that we really are possessed of, of this freedom, which uh, which which is unique. I'll leave it at that. Mm. Good. Yeah, I think that uh, free will is something. That's another thing that is denied pretty much today in a couple of ways. You know, one in the, frankly, religious adherence to the idea that eventually we'll be able to explain everything from the operation of parts interacting with each other. Now, definitely can't deny that that has explained plenty of things. You know, there's plenty of physical processes that you, you know, think about atoms and molecules, and you definitely get somewhere with that. But then when you add on to that a faith that eventually we're going to explain everything in terms of uh, particles interacting with each other, then you say that, well, that would include the brain. That would include the human individual. Eventually, one day, people have faith. We'll be able to explain the functioning of the brain in terms of chemistry or physics. And since the brain is what, you know, connects to our muscles and what we say and our, you know, is definitely connected to our mind, um, I mean, the brain is definitely related to the mind in some way. I don't think anybody can deny that. The, the people who have this faith say, well, that means it will explain the mind in terms of pieces eventually. And that forms part of the basis of the hope that some people have in artificial intelligence, that eventually computers will be able to be actually intelligent. And, you know, there's some ways that, I mean, being able to drive a car around, that's great. I would love a self-driving car. Um, you know, things like that. Can computers solve those kinds of problems? Sure. I know, it seems, seems reasonable. But a computer-run music composer, a computerized scientific laboratory that's going to try out a completely new hypothesis and figure out something that's never happened before. That's not something that's possible. Uh, and I'll tell you why. You're also not going to find it with animals. You know, animals don't have the power of the human mind. 
The reason that that will never happen is that the very basis of a discovery comes not from expressing something in terms that already exist, but in terms of changing the language itself. For example, what Einstein did in redefining those basic concepts of physics, of space and time, of energy and matter, transformed the language that you would even use to discuss the world in. The kind of non-logical aspect to discovery means that it's not something that some sort of computerized system or an animal or something purely biological would be able to do. So, you know, I think that in terms of free will, it reflects something that's absolutely unique about the human species and that's embedded in its highest form in economics. I mean, in a certain sense, economics is the highest of all sciences because it's the science that reflects upon that specifically human ability to transform our living from generation to generation. That specifically human capability to transform ourselves as a species. So when we consider what economics is as a discipline, as a field of study, we have to think not only of you know, nuts and bolts and producing food and electricity and water and money and all these kinds of things. Those are important. But those parts don't add up to the entirety of economics. And that's been Mr. LaRouche's insistence, and that was a discovery that he made, an approach some decades ago, that it was that ability of the mind to discover that would give rise to a different approach to economics, where you could take a measure of economic value, and instead of basing it on money and how much resources are worth to some sort of marketplace and you know prices, LaRouche could instead say, no, economic value comes from increasing the potential population density of the human species. That's economic value. What processes contribute to that? You know, there, there's a metric. Um, that's what I can, I can say about that. Maybe I've gotten a little bit far afield, but... <laughs> Uh, more than welcome, Jason. More than welcome. That was good. Um, so uh, let's take another question. Uh, hi, Jason. This is Rock out in Oregon. And I've Hello. got a question on some mundane details, biographical details of Einstein's life and work and education. And I wonder if you know and can tell me about um, whether he worked in patent offices in Germany. Was that was that his... Um, his line of work and did he also do this once he reached the states and then part b is did he um uh, have a particular area of expertise within the patent department and do you have any idea uh what patents he might have reviewed or approved and um because i think that might be interesting to know you know what kind of material he was um collecting in his own mm. imagination and whether he mm. was you know looking at breakthroughs routinely, uh, intellectual breakthroughs on a routine basis. And then the yeah. third would be, do you know if he knew anything about Alan Turing's work on the German Enigma code or if even that was published at the time? I don't know. That's all, though. Okay. Um, you know, that's a good question. You know, I, There's definitely worse jobs to have than working at a patent office if you want to have new ideas, that's for sure. I mean, his, you know, he, um, in terms of his, his academic career and, you know, his, what became his academic career and his work in the patent office. You know, there's stories people tell that you know, Einstein was a bad student. Um, and it's true. There were some fields he didn't exactly enjoy. And one of them was mathematics, for example, uh, something that he actually later in life regretted not having studied harder because then he had to work on it in the, the 19 teens to put, um, to create a, to create a, okay, let's keep going with the, the patent office business. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that his expert, I'm no expert, I'm pretty sure that his field was, um, was electronic devices, that kind of field. Uh, when he came to the U.S., he was definitely not working in a patent office anymore. After his, um, what they call miracle year of 1905, where he wrote these papers on Brownian motion and the photoelectric effect and special relativity and um, another one I'm forgetting. Um, it, it took some more years, but he eventually 
got himself into um, academic positions uh, in Europe. And then when he came to the United States, he wound up at the Institute for Advanced Study um, at Princeton. Um, I'm forgetting what the other thing. Oh, what 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 kinds of patents did he review? I don't know, but that uh, seems like an interesting question. And um, as far as his awareness of of Turing and the Enigma Code, I just uh, don't know anything about that. Although, given the opportunity to make a segue, I can point out that in the United States, um, he was not involved with the Atomic Project, with the, the Manhattan Project because he was considered a security threat. You know, one of the stories about Einstein is that as he was coming to the United States, he was presented with a you know, list of questions and interviews um, by the security services like the FBI. And Einstein just told them, he said, look, if you're gonna make me answer all these questions and you know, treat me like I'm some sort of threat like this, then I'm not gonna come to the United States. Forget it. <laughs> and then they, um, uh, they gave up on their questioning, but the uh, that the um, the book that uh, the 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 book that Fred had uh, mentioned, whose title I already forgot, might be a excellent source for finding out more about Einstein's life in particular. Hey, Jason, just on that just on that topic, in a sense, because of his work at the patent office, it's also where he was playing with what he calls this thought experiment of writing on a beam of light. I thought maybe, could you say maybe more on that just to get a, a sense of what does that say? Maybe what your thoughts are on Einstein's method and how he thought about science. I just think it's an interesting example. Uh, yeah. I, you know, there's one thing um didn't really get into was the, uh, was, let me say a little bit more about what relativity is. But yeah, as a young man, you know, as an adolescent, actually, he was asking himself the question of what would it look like to catch up with a beam of light? What would it look like if you were sort of floating along next to it as it moves through space? How would it appear to you? And it turns out that if you ask that question, light has to appear to you in a way that really doesn't make any sense. Um, the way it transforms itself in electricity and magnetism just seems completely it, it it's mean it, it doesn't make any sense from the viewpoint of you of you sitting right next to it. So I think from uh from very early in his life he was already getting on to the kinds of concepts that then drove him forward where a lot of the work that he did at the patent office I and mean, he was he was able to keep abreast of research that was taking place, you know, he was able to get copies of journals and read them. But he didn't have an experimental laboratory to work with. I mean, he'd work in his spare time uh, when he was doing his office job. Um, and that might be part of why many of his experiments that he describes are these so-called thought experiments, where you don't actually need to do the experiment to realize how your conceptions, when you put them together, lead to an impossibility. So it's really the same as the method of Plato or of Cusa or of Kepler, where Einstein says, okay, let's take our basic assumptions about motion. Um, let's say that you're either moving on a train or you're watching the train from the station or the embankment. Let's put together some of our assumptions and we come to a conclusion that we disagree with. For example, light appearing to move at a different speed for a different observer. Now, in order to reconcile the contradictions that arose between these different reference frames, Einstein put together basically just two ingredients to make up special relativity. One is that light is a physical process, like a law of nature. The motion of light isn't like a ball, you know, bouncing down the street towards you. Light is something else entirely. It's, it's a key physical characteristic. That's one. The second is the simple principle of equivalence of reference frames, something that Leibniz considered, for example, where according to Einstein's view, no matter how you're moving, truth doesn't change. The truth of the universe doesn't depend on if you're spinning in a circle and you look at it, or if you're sitting on a train looking at it, 
or if you're on the Earth versus on Mercury. I mean, if, if the laws of the universe were different, if observed from the Earth versus, say, Mercury, and we'd come to different conclusions about them, then, you know, the fact that life developed on Earth, that we live on Earth, might make it impossible for us to come to universal conclusions. It doesn't matter how you're moving. The laws of nature, mind, is the same, but it doesn't depend on motion. It's independent of that, prior to that. So put those two together. The universality of true physical concepts relative to different kinds of motion and the idea that light has the same motion for any observer, for any reference frame, that's all you really need to do. You just put those together and then that led Einstein to the conclusion that space and time were not separate and that they changed depending on how events were observed from different reference frames. So in that sense, it's a, it's a pretty simple concept, but it's so counterintuitive and it requires that space, that the lengths of objects, for example, change when they're observed to be moving. Things that just seem so counterintuitive and bizarre that they were, um, you know, they were they were rejected. They weren't universally accepted. Einstein's views were not that was universal uh, agreement by any means. Just to give Great, one, but, oh, oh, go ahead. Well, I don't want to get too detailed, but just to give one example about um, Lorentz. You know, this is one of these things that people say about Einstein is that Lorentz had these formulas for special relativity first. Yeah, he did. He had those formulas. But he, he didn't have relativity. Lorentz believed that there was a substance called the ether, that light moves through this ether at a constant speed, but that people moving with respect to the ether, like the Earth moving through this ether business as it goes around the sun, that that would actually change how light moved from the standpoint of us here on the Earth. And he had to invent those formulas that later fit with Einstein's theory in order to try to explain the ether and the idea that light was not the same speed for every observer. So <laughs> that's an example of getting the same formula but having two totally different ideas about it, which just goes to show you it's not, you know, it's, formulas aren't knowledge. Great. So we have another live question. Let's take, let's take this one. <clears throat> yes, hi, uh, it's Alvin here in New York. Uh, hi, Jason, Mike. I've um, been listening, and uh, I wanted to uh, first lay out a little bit of um, a lot of activity um, that's taking place here in Manhattan and throughout the New York area um, over the past, over this past week. Um, the second broadsheet uh, of the LaRouche Pact the Hamiltonian um, had has hit the streets, and uh, I think conservatively uh, this week some six thousand of these broadsheets have been uh, distributed by members and activists. Um, with uh, in, in in much of this conversation here revolving around Einstein, I think it'd be useful for people uh, as opposed to looking for. Uh, facts and, and data to read Keisha Rogers' article, uh, which appears there. This Hamiltonian is, a, once you read it and you start uh, distributing this thing, you begin to see uh, just from the, its headline alone, LaRouche's right and Wall Street now, uh, what a real uh, weapon, what a real tool you have to give people an opportunity to uh, straighten themselves out in a very short amount of time. Um, the other thing that's been going on, of course, is distribution uh, to build our core, uh, build our um, concert series that's uh, rapidly approaching. And uh, I've been involved with both of these deployments at various times, and the uh, concert leafleting is going very well. We've also gotten out about five or six thousand uh, of the 
leaflets uh, in the New York area. Um, and we're confident that we'll get another five or 6,000 out over the next three day period. Um, activists are uh, coming forward to help with that. And it's interesting to note, Jason, that uh, a lot of the people that have been really pushing this and uh, helping to distribute this are some of the very same young people that have been involved in the music and science program. So, uh, and they're having a lot of fun doing it. And um, some of them are also obviously members of the chorus. So, uh, you know, and I also uh, understand from a member that the organization has been in the UN this week distributing the uh, entire uh, two-day conference that is now in a uh, solid book form um, with the new paradigm that took place, this uh, conference that took place in Germany. So we have these various fronts actively uh, taking uh, hold all in this one week. Uh, so without a doubt, without seeing anything, you know that the effect of LaRouche is definitely uh, being felt and will continue to be felt. Um, on Einstein, if I could, I just want to read briefly what something Keisha has here, a quote from Einstein, since he's uh, been a subject now that Lynn continues to, to raise and we're trying to figure this out. And from his Society and Personality, published in 1934, The World as I See It, Einstein writes, the only, individ only the individual can think and thereby create new values for society, nay, even set up new moral standards to which the life of the community conforms. Without creative personalities able to think and judge independently, the upward development of society is as unthinkable as the development of the individual personality without the nourishing soil of the community. And uh, I urge people uh, on the call to go through this, read this broadsheet um, that's currently out and distributed. Because when you talk about geopolitical, uh, financial, economic, cultural matters, it's all here. All of these things are being addressed. And the idea of what I'm trying to understand of what Lynn is saying, I think is captured very much for me. Uh, without knowing much, particularly about his theories and formulas, but the essence of his uh, creative mind, um, we see that we can do this now with these various fronts that we're pushing. And uh, for Mike and Jason, I you know one of the I guess it's a quasi report, but I'd like to hear you both you know respond accordingly to uh, what I've laid out here and what we're doing in Manhattan. Definitely good to get that report. I mean, um, here's a, let me start, I got another quote here that seems like it's on a similar vein from Einstein. He wrote that concern for man himself and his fate must always form the chief interest of all technical endeavors. Never forget this in the midst of your diagrams and equations. I think some other aspects of him, like his connection to the civil rights fight, for example, um, you know, as we covered the other day with um, Marian Anderson, Marian Anderson and um, you know, Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, there is, um, you know, as an, as an entire individual, as somebody who has got thoughts about political views, things outside of science per se, um, we definitely see the same aspect of his personality. I mean, also, not to be too Einstein-focused and only talk about him all the time, I mean, I think that this, you know, what you're bringing up about the work that we're doing, um, the work that we're doing with the UN, with creating a new paradigm is you know, this is something to reflect on, the fact that we are succeeding in driving the world in a new direction, in a better direction, through the power of ideas, through concepts that people are able to reflect on and 
recognize as being you know, a powerful way to improve the meaning of their life into the future. And in the various aspects of our activity, from musical work, political work, you had mentioned the, the work with young people on science and on music, there's a real resonance in the human soul with the kinds of beautiful concepts that best reflect who we really are as people. And this is something that people get excited about, a recognition of what it is to be a human being, that they're more than they thought they were. And especially when you take that to the level of recognizing that you have a power to help make that occur and shape the direction that the world is going to be in, that's a real recognition of what you are as a human being, as somebody who has got an identity where you can shape what will the immortality, what will the contribution be, not just of your life, but by affecting these larger political or social scale processes, you're able to give increased meaning to millions of people's lives through you know, the changed value of what somebody does even in a better world, even if they didn't help bring it into being, simply by being part of a creative or productive process. Like people who indirectly contributed to the Apollo mission to go to the moon, even if they weren't organizing for the space program itself, if their activity, if their labor, if their economic activity contributed, even indirectly in that, they were participating in something that was much bigger than they were. And by bringing about, by bringing into effect those kinds of trajectories, we get to transform the value of, you know, of so many people, we get to give mankind a real mission, a real value. Great. Now, we also have a question um, from someone online, and they say, um, the discussion is interesting, but he says, not all of us are quantum theorists. So how can bending light save the world in the next four months? So Jason, perhaps you have a response to that. <laughs> well, yeah, bending light's not gonna not gonna change the world in the next four months per se. I mean, you know, the application isn't that we're gonna use special relativity to, I don't know, create a black hole and suck Obama out of the White House or something like that. But um and I, I think that the uh I think the question's also getting at about you know, how does how does science play a role? Like take for example the outlook that China's adopting right now. I mean I think that at least people who are frequently on this call, I don't even need to go over, um, but of course for the new people, you know, all the projects that China's engaged in right now about saying that, hey, the mission for the G20 meeting that's going to take place uh, very soon, that the agenda for this G20 meeting of heads of state is the economy. How are we going to cooperate and move the economy forward and eliminate poverty and, and develop? That's what China's saying. That's the agenda. And if you look at how they've done that and taking hundreds of millions of Chinese people out of poverty in the past few decades, you know, at a rate right now that far surpasses um, India's as a, as a comparison, and you look at what China's doing with their lunar program, where they've stated the explicit goal of developing eventually the helium-3 resources of the moon. Um, helium-3 is a potential future, uh, fusion fuel. And you consider what China's doing also on the field of fusion, of developing the, um, with their superconducting tokamak, you know, they're on, the, they're on the cutting edge of fusion research. So, you know, in, if you contrast that with the U.S., you know, we don't have a, we've got a lot of responding to events right now. You know, we've got a response to 9-11. We've got a response to, you know, a Wall Street catastrophe. But where's the long-term future-oriented thinking? Where's the prospective thinking of, hey, here's what we're going to have meant in 50 years. You know, here's how we're going to play a role that's appropriate for a leading nation in the world by providing and stimulating the next breakthroughs that are really going to transform mankind. You know, where's our financing of fusion? It's pathetic right now in the U.S. Where's our space program? 
you know, we've got some things that have some sort of inertia, but it's we don't have a large space mission right now. So, you know, I think that the um, so let me read. Uh, I'll, I'll find it quickly. Um, the quote from uh, from Einstein about you know, he said that as a young man he realized that just trying to make money and get by in the world was not, you know, that wasn't satisfying. That's not really human. But he then ended up getting into religion. He realized not all the stories in the Bible were literally true. He felt like he was being lied to, that the young people were being lied to. He developed a certain sort of skepticism. But then in his desire to free himself from the chains of the merely personal, from an existence which is dominated by wishes, hopes, and primitive feelings of the self, he thought that out yonder there was a huge world which exists independently of us human beings and which stands before us like a great eternal riddle, at least partially accessible to our inspection and thinking. The contemplation of this world beckoned like a liberation. And I soon noticed that many a man whom I had learned to esteem and to admire had found inner freedom and security in devoted occupation with it. The mental grasp of this extra-personal world within the frame of the given possibilities swam as highest aim, half consciously and half unconsciously, before my mind's eye. Similarly motivated people of the present and of the past, as well as the insights which they had achieved, were friends which could not be lost. The road to this paradise was not as comfortable and alluring as the road to the religious paradise, but it has proved itself as trustworthy, and I have never regretted having chosen it. So I think in terms of, you know, what really satisfies the human individual, what is the identity that satisfies the yearning that we have to be more than ourselves, more than our own individual petty desires and wishes? What's our connection to something greater than that? Einstein says we can find this in our devotion to understanding that great world that we live in. And as these other quotes, as from Alvin show, you know, he understood that in doing so, we are providing the means to improve the lives of our fellow human beings. And um, the meaning of those lives, if we bring people into participation, in that kind of development. So, you know, general relativity isn't going to, um, you know, maybe directly be the key on something like that. But every person has a potential, and that's got to be the basis of our society and of our relationships to each other. That's what lies behind that person walking past you on the street. What's their potential? Great. Let's take the next question. Hi, this is Anna from New Jersey. Um, okay, um, it's not really more of a question or it's more of a statement. Um, as far as science, um, there's a lot more also manipulation going on. I'm sure you guys are full aware of what's going on um, our government's doing like a patent that's uh, hacking and controlling our nervous systems through computers or computers, sorry, computers, TV, uh, telephones, like the U.S. patent 6506148 or different programs that our government has done. Um, like Anna, do you have a specific in, question? Like, um, it's still going on to this day, and as far as science, how do we stop like programs that are continued to this day to stop? Like Einstein was against this. Like at this at a point, there was a time like I'm I've read different documentaries. Like you know, there was the Philadelphia Project and the Montauk Project, and um, Tesla was involved with this, and they wanted. Einstein to be participating to participate into this, but Einstein had a conscience. He didn't want people to partic partic 
participate into this because it's, it's inhuman. It's inhumane. And a lot of this is going on even well, Anna, to Anna, let's, Anna, let's, yeah. let's, let's leave, let's leave the question there because it is a relevant topic. I think it perhaps a bit more specific on the question of the use of well, the nuclear bomb. Well, it is relevant, but I mean, oh, our uh, government uh, is doing I, different oh, programs. What, what I wanted to say was that um, it's actually relevant to the question of the use of the nuclear bomb. Um, and Einstein was obviously directly involved both in the capability of the development of atomic weapons, but also in the question of, of, of what that meant for mankind. So Jason, perhaps the power of that capability. So Jason, perhaps you can say something to that extent because Einstein did very much so unleash a, a massive change in mankind's technological power. Yes, I, I also want to say something about, you know, our personal approach to these sorts of things. Um, well, for, you know, first on the nuclear front, I mean, Einstein recognized that there was a tremendous potential reservoir of unexplored power just waiting to be exploited. This comes from, for example, the, one of the results of his special theory of relativity if you play with it a little bit, you end up getting that there's a certain energy in every mass, in every um, in every mass, it's that mass times the speed of light squared, which is a tremendous amount of energy. And this is what gets, this is connected to the liberation of power that we see in nuclear processes, for example. So with our current nuclear fission plants that make electricity or with the research that we have on fusion, um, there really is a very measurable transformation of mass into energy. And the incredible difference of power of that compared to all forms of chemical energy is about 100,000 or a million times greater. That is, once you start looking at adjusting or having reactions or transformations of the nucleus of an atom, as opposed to only changing which atoms are joined together in molecules, you've got a realm of power that's about a million times beyond the entire believed to be possible world of all chemical energy that existed before the nuclear era. And if that isn't developed, we aren't going to have the necessary reservoirs of power and ability to deal with our materials needs going into the future, for example, the needs to be able to, um, you know, get raw materials and process them, um, to deal with our water issues, to deal with our power issues, for things like also space power, the ability to stop an asteroid from striking the Earth, this sort of thing. So there's a whole, you know, world of uh, potential power for the human species that exists out there that's been so incredibly underdeveloped um, and has got to be move forward. Uh, on the other thing is, you know, I'd just like to repeat what I'd said a little earlier in the show about the, the, the sort of victim mentality that is easy to, that's frequently adopted um, in a world where it seems like nothing very good is happening, at least not in this country, where people find it easy to feel powerless and almost in a sort of, um, and this is a general sort of observation I've made in sort of a general sort of almost masochistic way, hoping that there is like some sort of conspiracy that can't be overcome um, as a way of transforming personal responsibility into um, victimhood. Now, we've got to take, and you know, everybody on this call, it's up to us, each person has got to take responsibility for developing an identity of leadership, of developing the knowledge that's necessary to organize, of developing the knowledge that's necessary to figure out and actively participate in creating a better future for the world, of having a sense of what that future ought to be like, of what kinds of, what the focus ought to be on it. So, you know, of understanding and participating in science, in music, in culture, in living that future now as a way of better being able to bring it into being in a more full way into the future. So, I mean, that, that's, that's what I'd like to say on that. I mean, whether it be technology or politics or whenever you're, whenever we're confronted with something that's, you know, 
bad or seen as being foisted upon us, the response really is the same. It doesn't really matter that much. The question is standing up and <laughs> changing what's happening, you know, forcing a different direction of developing the most effective flanks or approaches for bringing that about. So I think it's a question um, really of personal responsibility to make that happen. Great, very useful. Okay, another question here from West Virginia. Hi, this is Tracy, and um, I have a question. I have a, a social media following with thousands of people, and I've noticed the resurgence of people that actually believe that the Earth is flat. Um, and they might actually appear intelligent. They will agree on Mr. LaRouche and on issues concerning bricks and glass eagle, et cetera. But on this issue of science, they completely freak out. And I tell them that they are victims of Bertrand and Russell. And by the way, Jason, I've seen the video and it's, I love the video on uh, Leibniz versus Bertrand Russell, that that was the first video that I really watched of, of LaRouche Pack, and I was completely sold on that. And um, I especially share that video. Um, anyway, I need to know how these anti-science cults appear to be present in society right now. Well, I think part of what makes it possible is sort of like um, if you've got the spread of a disease because no one's being inoculated against it. So, you know, it, the, we really think we're very modern these days. Many people believe that. You know, we're part of the modern era. We don't have any of these silly old beliefs of our benighted ancestors who thought all sorts of silly old things. But we don't think those anymore. We're so intelligent. We live in the modern era. We can look it up on Wikipedia. But the fact is, how about how about if we went through and in school reperformed the experiment done by Eratosthenes, you know, two millennia ago, where he determined not just that the Earth was round, but gave an approximate measure for how large it was. And he did that without sailing around the planet. You know, it's a very, very simple experiment. It's, um, it's just done by measuring shadows in, uh, in two positions on the Earth. He did it in a couple of different positions in Egypt. And it's something that, you know, and uh, I know that, that I've been involved in, just, you know, personally. Um, you can do it with some, some friends in different cities in the country. And by measuring the angles of shadows at noon, um, you can come up with a pretty rough estimate of how big the Earth is. So I think the way that this anti-sciencism um, takes hold is there just isn't any science. I mean, if you go through school and you learn how to take tests as opposed to, you know, actually learning something, well, you're not going to be very good at separating out what's true and what's false. I'll give an anecdote. Um, I was involved in, I was one of the teachers in this program that Alvin had mentioned of uh, science and, and music um, teaching with, with young people in New York City this summer. And one of the things I went through is I, I wrote up the Pythagorean theorem. I drew a right triangle. I wrote that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And the kids said, sure, yeah, that's true. And I said, well, how do you know it's true? And, you know, they gave various um, explanations that didn't really quite work. Like they gave specific numbers that made the formula work, which doesn't prove it has anything to do with triangles. And, um, you know, uh, eventually where this went to is one of, the, one of the students had said, oh, I, I get the point. You know, he's saying you shouldn't just believe everything your teachers tell you. You should question more. And I said, well, not really. Yeah. Questioning is great, but you know what's a lot better than questioning? Answering. Now, what we need is we've got this rich treasure trove of discoveries that have been made in the past. And we've got thousands of years of human history, you know, a couple thousand of recorded human history. We've got a lot of great thoughts, experiments that can be easily recreated today, you know, that can be done where we can avail ourselves of this rich history and become way more intelligent. You know, we can just do that with our time. So it's a not an accident, but it is deliberate. Education is as bad as it is today, where nobody, you know, 
I mean, I've asked a lot of people about this. Practically nobody has ever actually, when they learned it in school, gone through why the Pythagorean theorem is true, for example. You just memorize it and use it on a test. So if every school child, in conjunction with the school located somewhere else in the country, or preferably directly north or south, um, did this Eratosthenes experiment, then all these children would know for themselves, not just their surrounds, but they will have themselves participated in doing an experiment to measure how big it is. So that's really the inoculation. Uh, you know, a lot of times the getting at the specific things, it may or may not go anywhere because the people that we're talking to, or we ourselves, may not have a reservoir of real knowledge of you know, what's true, what's tr a truthful approach in science to base our, our other judgments on. And, you know, I think that's also very important in music, that we've got a musical culture in the U.S., a prevailing musical culture, that's very unreasonable. That's not at all befitting what it really is to be a human being. You know, very short, repetitive songs, really dull themes in general. If they're not ugly, they're just usually kind of boring or self-centered. You know, the kind of beautiful music that has been created in the past. Where is that? The great scientific breakthroughs that have been made, the books that have been written, the opportunity to re-perform for ourselves these experiments that brought us to today. Why don't we take advantage of these things? Why don't we create another renaissance and build on the beauty that we can we can look to? It's there for the taking. And I think that's really the the only sustainable or, you know, thoroughly effective way uh, of addressing a lack of science that requires a, you know, science education. And that, it, uh, that might take a while, you know, both for society as a whole and then also with individuals to become, um, to become familiar with that. Great. So we do have about 15 more minutes if people want to jump into the queue. Uh, you, do, you hit star six to get involved in the discussion tonight. We have one question lined up, Jason. This comes from Jerome, who had asked a question earlier. I think the second question tonight. But he jumped back in, so let's see what he's thinking. OK. Hello. Thank you for calling on me again. Your comments on Einstein are just very, very provocative. And I have a couple of things to add. When Einstein came to the United States, he continued his patent interest. He patented a new kind of propeller for a submarine that was actually adopted during World War II. And he patented a new kind of refrigerator. And these two patents alone show that Einstein was intensely interested in practical uses for everything. Which brings us to that question of how can the blinding, bending power of uh, gravity affecting light affect us? Well, it can affect us a whole bunch. There is a point on the other side of the sun called the Lagrangian point five. It's very, very sure. near. Hello? Yeah, Further? yeah. Do you have a you have a you have a question you want to pose to Jason or I mean I don't know if we I don't know if we have time for multiple questions so you 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 did just ask one should we leave it there and see if Jason has a response Sure I'll leave it there <laughs> but I know the answer already but let's let's give Jason a shot Well, well I, think, I think I think you think you're getting the conversation going I see Yeah, yeah well. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the other funny, you know, the funny stories about Einstein is he you know, also developed a new type of refrigerator technology. So, yeah, I mean, he definitely worked on a lot of different um, directions. Um, as far as, uh, you know, gravity and light, and, you know, I, I guess we'll maybe find out another time also uh, you know, some other ideas on this. But I'll just give one example that's, I think, pretty fun, uh, which is that, uh, I'm, free, I'm so bad with time. You know, about within the past year or so, that LIGO experiment um, had discovered or had experienced, it gave observational evidence for a gravity wave that was passing through the Earth. 
by changing very, very slightly the distances um, in, in different directions of very long tubes that lasers were passing through in two places in the United States. Um, now, that was a more direct observation of something that had been found in the 70s, where in studying uh, pulsars, there was already a sense of an indirect evidence for the gravitational waves that Einstein had predicted from his theory. So I think that with the kinds of experiments that have been done, a general relativity or Einstein's theory on that, it's moved far beyond something that needs testing or something that we should try out or, you know, is it really true? Instead, it's something that's used as a basis for now doing new types of uh, doing new types of astronomy and using it to reach conclusions about the whole universe around us. And there's so much that needs to be figured out um, on, in the astronomical front. And a lot of it, you know, we're talking about how the track of science has really shifted over the past hundred years away from discovering a reality and much more into describing observations or finding formulas that describe observations. And I think astronomy is a very clear example of that, where, you know, dark energy or dark matter, um, some of these concepts that are introduced to sort of, you know, plug the hole that at best are more placeholders, I think, than, than a real final discovery that I think really point to the fact that we might have totally new breakthroughs to make um, about physical world on the scale of the universe. Jason, implicitly also what Jerome had raised was this, I think, this question of practicality. Huh. And I think, um, you know, we were discussing it a little bit today, but you can obviously see that these questions of Einstein and his discoveries and the universe that he was considering and, and discovering almost seem as if they're an escape, a pleasant escape from the very more complex and harsh reality of this political situation, mm. the very, very accelerating financial collapse, all of the tension and ambiguity around that. So, you know, yeah, we've got all that, but let's talk about something more pleasant, more provocative, right. Einstein's discoveries. And I don't, that's not exactly what Lynn's getting at. And so maybe you can address, because I think it is at the heart of the issue of why are these, why is this question, this whole discussion tonight, which I think has been wonderful, why is this, why is this how we are actually, why is this so relevant to the political crisis that we face on the planet today? Mm, right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. That's, you know, this is something that confronts us all the time is that we've got, <laughs> we're, we're sort of got a, a funny combination of, it might seem like a, an unusual combination of things in a, in a, in a movement or at least compared to you know, many political movements, is we've got an incredibly intense political situation. We're in you know, a direct combat about getting Glass-Steagall, eliminating the financial system that is just hell-bent on destroying the world, if that's what it takes, to prevent a new system from coming into being. And at the same time, we're involved in you know, Mozart concerts. We're discussing, we're spending time discussing Albert Einstein. You know, what's the, what's the connection? How is that relevant? Don't we need to throw out Obama right now? And it's, it's not really a contradiction. I think, you know, why is that? You know, there's always more to discover about what it is to be human. And any discoveries that we make, any new insights that we gather into ourselves personally, when we engage in that really human activity, like we've just come out of a rehearsal of Mozart's Requiem, or we've just been reading together in a group um, some work by Einstein or, or Kepler. You know, with that comes a greater, more solid recognition of what the human species is, what the human species can become. And you need a basis like that to have you know, uh, a strength to fight. You also need it to have a vision of where mankind needs to go and where we could be. I mean, in only looking, if we were only to look at, you know, the problems that surround us, 
okay, then of course we'd be lacking the solutions. But even the solutions that we put forward, like we can imagine what it would be like to have a high-speed rail network in the U.S. perhaps. And that would be great. You know, we could, that would be wonderful. Let's do it. Let's do it. Some of these more intangible things, like what would it really, what would we really be as people if we had a space mission? For example, you know, 50 years ago during the, you know, or, or you know, during, during the era of Apollo, it wasn't something that most people found hard to understand. You know, gee, why would we be, why would we be doing this? Yeah, there was dispute about it, but this was a period of intense economic productivity gain in the United States, this, this Apollo era. So the things go together. You know, when we're being human, when we're developing science, when we're developing culturally, that's what, you know, creates a renaissance, and that's what we need. So we don't need to wait for and shouldn't wait for all these political objectives to be fulfilled to then say, oh, good, now we can, now we can get into, you know, creating, creating the beauty. We need it right now to have a leadership to be able to bring it about on a broader scale as we move into the future. Let's develop a beautiful sense of what it is to be a human being and then make that happen. And then we're coming from a very solid and, if I'm overusing the word, but a beautiful um, starting point on that. I mean, we're really, the, we're the beautiful species. Humanity is the most beautiful species on this planet. And we're operating so far below that identity that it is astonishing. And, you know, we almost lose sight of what we really could be. And it's very important to take examples and take the time to, to bring that to life and recognize that and then use that. Wonderful. Well, Jason, I'm rather happy with the discussion tonight. Uh, we don't have anybody else lined up, and it's about time to wrap up. So maybe you have some final thoughts, and um, we can keep keep working at this revolution. <laughs> yeah, I'd just say, you know, um, jump into it. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, one caller, Fred, had asked about a particular Einstein book. There's, there's a number of books available. You know, read a biography. Um, you know, read this relativity book by Einstein. Um, and you know, really, I, I'd say that the real, the real thing to do on it too is get active, be involved. If you're on this call and you're not already organizing with us around, you know, uh, if you're in the New York area around all the tremendous amounts of activity that we've got going on there, but wherever you are in the country or in the world, you know, be involved organizing with us. And the these other Einstein, for example, or music takes on a very different aspect when you're identifying yourself as somebody who's going to make things happen. And then you say, what tools do I need to achieve that objective? It's not just entertainment or something to, you know, to, to feel good, although it certainly is fun to work on and very rewarding. But these are tools that we need when we take ourselves uh, seriously and we demand ourselves to be able to function on the highest level and be the highest leaders that we're capable of being. This stuff's necessary. And our leadership is necessary. More people taking on an identity of responsibility for the path that the world's going to go, or especially for the, <laughs> the role the U.S. is going to play in it, that's absolutely essential right now. That upshift in identity is essential. Great. And is there more that you can say about what the, uh, some of your collaborators, what, what the plans are in terms of upcoming is there going to be another presentation next Wednesday? Oh, yes. Uh, is there yes. A yeah, the Wednesday shows are back. So, yeah, after, a, you know, a, you know, our, our hiatus, uh, you can expect to see the new Paradigm for Mankind shows on the LaRouche Pack site on Wednesdays again. I know that we're going to have some more on Einstein in a couple of weeks. This coming week, we're going to be taking up the... Um, and certainly responding to the recent announcement from China about plans that they're looking into to build a radar array on the moon for Earth observation to discuss the far side of the moon more broadly and um, and what this what this means for 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 what we are as people and uh, we will be having definitely more Einstein shows so on Wednesdays we're back <laughs> and we take questions so yeah, those shows um, 
you know, ask, uh, ask questions. And if you're watching this recorded, ask questions in the comments section. We come back to those and address them in future shows. So let us hear from you. We be good to, yeah, get, send, send in your reactions, some questions. Excellent. Thanks. Well, thanks, Jason, for being with us tonight. Thanks. And um, I think that's a, a good close for the call. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending and participating. Uh, circulate this call out to your friends and networks. Let's keep organizing and inspiring people. We'll obviously have the, uh, the webcast discussion tomorrow night, the Manhattan discussion on Saturday, and a lot of work to do in these coming weeks. I think everyone can expect significant changes to the world over the coming days and weeks ahead. Let's make sure those changes are in the right direction. And after, other than that, have a good night. That's the end of this call. Your conference recording has stopped. Goodbye.